founding the Han Dynasty. After Qin commander Zhang Han defeated the first rebel attack inside the Hanku Pass, Wu Qin went to Zhao where he set himself up as king of Zhao, Qin Yu as general, and Zhang Er and Xiao Cao as prime ministers. Rebel leader Chen Shei, Chen Shei wanted to have all their families executed, but his chief minister, Tsai Tzu, convinced him that this would be plaguing the people with a second Qin. So he confirmed their positions. Chen Shei, calling himself King of Chu, asked them for troops to attack the Hanku Pass again. But they decided it was safer to seize Yin. Chang Han attacked the city of Chen and killed Tsai Tzu. Chen Shei retreated and was murdered by his carriage driver. Chen Shei had ruthlessly executed an old peasant friend of his for embarrassing him and had appointed two men who severely punished generals who did not carry out orders exactly. Two officials in Pei, Xiao Ho and Cao Zhan, urged the magistrate there to revolt, but he changed his mind. Liu Ji shot a message over the wall which convinced the people of Pei to execute the magistrate, which they did. They then insisted that Liu Qi be their new governor, and his following quickly grew to 3,000 men. Meanwhile, members of the royal Tian family in Qi had set themselves up as sovereigns there, and the martial family of Xiang Liang and his nephew Xiang Yu arose in Wu. Xiang Lang gave the new governor of Pei 5,000 infantry to attack Fang. Hearing that Chen Shei was dead, Xiang Liang and the governor of Pei set up the grandson of former King Huai as King of Chu. The governor of Pei and Xiang Yu defeated Qin forces at Changyang and massacred its inhabitants. Xiang Liang boasted of his victories over Qin but was defeated and killed by Zhang Han. Fearful, King Huai of Chu moved his capital, capital to Pingcheng. He appointed the governor of Pei a marquis and Xiang Yu, Duke of Lu, and second general under Sun Yi, both of whom he, went, he sent north to rescue Zhao from Chang Han's attacks. The governor of Pei he sent west to enter the Hanku Pass, promising that whoever should enter the pass first and conquer the Qin region should be king there. The bold Xiang Yu wanted to attempt the pass, but King Huai's elder generals advised him that Xiang Yu, who had butchered the inhabitants of Shang Cheng, was too impetuous and cruel. They argued that the tolerance and moral stature of the governor of Pei would be more likely to win over the suffering people of Qin. So Xiang Yu went north with Sun Yi, whose head he personally cut off for refusing to attack in spite of hunger and cold though he said that Sun Yi was plotting with Qi. Confirmed as Supreme General, Xiang Yu led his Chu armies across the Yellow River, sunk his own boats and smashed the cooking pots, and after nine battles defeated the Qin army. It was at this time that Zhang Ahan sent for instructions from the Qin Emperor and decided to ally himself with the revolt. Meanwhile, the governor of Pei gained the advisor Li Yiqi, who told him how to capture Qin's stores of grain. Another advisor, Chang Liang, told him not to pass by the city of Yuan, where he was persuaded to enfeoff its surrendering governor. Then Chang Liang sent Li Yiqi and Lu Jia to bribe Qin's generals. The governor of Pei ordered his men not to plunder or seize prisoners and the Qin armies were easily defeated. Soon, Zhu Ying, the king of Qin, surrendered with a rope around his neck. When the governor of Pei entered the capital at Xianyang, he ordered Qin's treasures sealed up, and then he abolished all of Qin's irksome laws, except for murder and reasonable punishments for assault and theft. The people of Qin rejoiced and brought gifts to the governor of Pei, but he declined them. Xiao Ho collected Qin's important charts, registers, and documents, which later proved of strategic value. 
The governor of Pei claimed to have a force of 200,000, which was actually 100,000, while Xiang Yu came through the pass claiming 1 million men, which was actually 400,000. The governor of Pei apologized to General Xiang Yu for guarding the pass at first and explained that he had preserved Qin's treasures while waiting for him. After killing Qin King Tzu Ying and burning the capital, Xiang Yu declared King Huai the just emperor and himself protector king of Western Chu. But going back on the promise to the general who first entered the pass, he assigned the Qin area to Chang An Han and two other former Qin generals, while the governor of Pei was made king of Han. Various generals and nobles were set up as 18 local kings. Angry at the broken promise, the king of Han wanted to attack Xiang Yu, but was restrained by Xiao Ho. So, in 206 BC, they all went to their own sovereignties. Han Xin persuaded the king of Han that his new position was really an exile, and that this was the time he could reunify Qin and then march east. That summer, the king of Han made a surprise attack and defeated Zhang Han and the other Qin generals. He proclaimed an amnesty for criminals, allowed the people to use the parks and orchards that had been imperial Qin reserves, and granted two years exemption from taxes and services. He appointed a local leader in each district from those over aged 50 with cultivated personalities. In the east, Xiang Yu had the just emperor moved and then assassinated. In Qi, he tried to replace King Tian Jun with Tian Du, and he sent Peng Yue to lead a revolt in Liang. Chen Yu, resenting that he had not been made a king, asked Tian Jun to join him in attacking Chen's friend Zhang Er, king of Changshan, who fled to join the king of Han. Xiang Yu attacked and defeated Tian Jun and made all of Qi submit to Chu. But by burning its cities and enslaving the women and children, the people of Qi were aroused to revolt again. In 205 BC, the king of Han headed east and got the support of the king of Wei and subdued the king of Yin. As he crossed the Yellow River, a local leader told him that the just emperor was dead. The king of Han proclaimed mourning and vowed vengeance against Shang Yu. With Shang Yu busy in Qi, the king of Han was able to enter his capital at Peng Cheng. But Xiang Yu marched back and inflicted a bloody defeat on the king of Han capturing his parents, wife, and children. The king of Han escaped to the west, but many abandoned his cause. However, by establishing his base at Xingyang near the Owl Granary, he was able to rebuild and supply his army. Xiang Yu attacked and cut off the Han supply road and then surrounded the Han army. The king of Han suggested they divide the empire in two, but Xiang Yu refused. Using the subterfuge of women dressed in armor and a general impersonating the king, once again the king of Han managed to escape with a few horsemen, this time to within the pass. Eventually, Xiang Yu and the king of Han personally faced each other across the ravine at Guangwu. Xiang Yu, the invincible warrior, challenged the king of Han to a single combat. But the latter accused the former of breaking the promise, murdering Sun Yi, burning the palaces of Qin and killing its king, slaughtering 200,000 men he had tricked into surrendering, replacing local kings with his generals, and driving out and assassinating the just emperor. The king of Han intended to punish him for these crimes, but Xiang Yu shot an arrow, wounding him in the chest, though the king of Han pretended it was his foot. Han Xin was winning victories in the east, and the king of Han reluctantly appointed him king of Qi. The king of Han had to levy a poll tax for the first time, but magnanimously ordered coffins so that killed soldiers' bodies could be returned home. After suffering repeated attacks by Peng Yue and Han Xin, Xiang Yu's army had little food. So he agreed to divide the emperor with the king of Han and released his family. The king of Han was going to return to his western domain 
but his advisors persuaded him that this was the opportunity to pursue Xiang Yu. At first, he suffered a grave defeat from Chu, but with the help of Han Xin and Ping Yue, he gathered a force of 300,000 to Xiang Yu's 100,000. The Han soldiers sang the songs of Chu, which convinced the soldiers of Xiang Yu that Han had conquered Chu. Xiang Yu fled in despair, pursued by Han cavalry who killed 80,000. After killing many enemies himself, Xiang Yu eventually cut his own throat. Xiang Yu died believing he was destroyed by heaven. But the historian Summa Qian criticized him for not accepting responsibility for his errors. Finally, in 202 BC, the King of Han assumed the position of Supreme Emperor and was renamed Gao Tzu, meaning Exalted Ancestor. Han Xin was transferred to be King of Chu, Peng Yue was made King of Liang, and Wu Jui King of Shangsha. Xin, King of a different Han, and Qing Pu, King of Huainan, and Song Du, King of Yan, and Chang Ao, King of Zhao, were all confirmed in their positions. Armies were disbanded, and Gao Tzu made his capital at Luoyang, giving credit to advisor Zhang Liang, Chancellor Xiao Ho, and General Han Xin. Although Luoyang was considered the center of the world, Liu Jing persuaded the emperor that in these circumstances, it would be more strategic to locate his capital inside the Hangu Pass. Accordingly, Cao Tzu established the imperial capital near Xianyang at Chang'an and declared a general amnesty. All slaves were freed, and refugees and exiles had their civil rights restored. During Cao Tzu's seven-year reign, most of the kings were suspected of revolting and replaced by members of Cao Tzu's family. Song Du was replaced in Yen by Cao Tzu's boyhood friend Lu Wan. Han Xin was arrested and demoted. The other Han Xin joined the Xiong Nu, threatening his Han kingdom. The emperor's son-in-law, Chang Chang Ao of Zhao, conspired to assassinate Cao Tzu and was demoted. General Peng Yue was arrested, sent into exile, and then executed. Qing Bu's rebellion was defeated and he was killed. Lu Wan came under suspicion and moved his family and troops outside the Great Wall. When Cao Tzu died in 195 BC, nine of his sons and relatives ruled kingdoms, and only the small realm of Changsha was outside the imperial house. Gradually, Emperor Cao Tzu became more receptive to Confucian influences. Once he angrily declared to Lu Jie that he had won everything on horseback and asked him why he should bother with the odes and documents. Master Lu asked whether he could rule the empire on horseback. He noted rulers who failed because they paid too much attention to military affairs. If Qin had practiced goodness and justice, this emperor, emperor would never have arisen. To the emperor's delight, Lu Jia wrote a book called New Discourses, explaining why Qin lost the emperor and Cao Tzu won it. An edict in 196 BC proclaimed that those with reputations for virtue were to be sent to the chancellor so that they could be given appropriate positions. The heir apparent was Ying, the son of Empress Lu. But Cao Tzu felt that his son, Zhu Yi, by the concubine Lady Qi, was more like him. However, his advisors were able to dissuade him from changing the heir apparent, which could cause conflict and turmoil. When Cao Tzu died in 195 BC, the Empress Lu was persuaded to proclaim mourning and a general amnesty. Her son succeeded as Emperor Hui in his 16th year. Empress Lu imprisoned Lady Qi and sent for her son Zhu Yi, who was king of Zhao. The kind Emperor Hui kept Zhu Yi with him to protect him, but returned from one hunting one morning to find he had been poisoned. The Empress Lu also had Lady Qi mutilated so horribly that the Emperor, when he found out, sent a message to his mother that no human being could have done such a thing. As her son, he reasoned that he was not fit to rule the empire and gave himself up to drinking. Empress Lu also tried to poison his brother Liu Fei, King of Qi. When Emperor Hui died in 188 BC, 
the Empress Lu set up his three-year-old son by a consort as emperor. She established four of her nephews as kings and passed six Lu babies off as children of Hui. Empress Lu had the emperor's real mother killed, and when he was old enough to discover that Empress Lu's daughter was not his real mother, he declared he would change things when he grew up. So Empress Lu had him declared insane and replaced him with an even younger child. She had three kings of Zhao killed in succession, wiped out the royal families of Liang and Yan as well, and divided Qi into four kingdoms. When she was bitten by a mysterious dog, the diviner declared it the evil spirit of Zhu Yi, and she died of it in 180 BC. Although Lu family members were strategically placed as prime minister and commanding general, other officials who had sworn to Emperor Kaozu that his family line should not be replaced managed to oust them, kill the Lu family, and make the king of Dai Emperor Wen. Although not the oldest of Kaozu's living sons, he was selected both for his own ability and because his mother's family was of better character than the king of Qi's, who had someone they said was rebellious and no better than a tiger with a hat on. In spite of the macabre palace intrigues, the Taoist inactive rulership of Emperor Hui and his mother actually allowed the people a time of peace and prosperity, according to Taoist historian Su Ma Qin. In Qi, the prime minister from 194 to 185 BC, Cao San, was so won over to Taoism that he gave his authority in the main hall to his teacher, Master Gai and the state enjoyed such peace that he was known as a worthy minister. This peace and prosperity was continued by the benevolent policies of Emperor Wen. In his first year, he questioned the laws that punished the relatives of criminals as unjust and had these joint accusations and punishments abolished. At first, he wanted to search for a virtuous person to be his heir but later gave in to the tradition of appointing the oldest son as a stabilizing practice. He made sure that the elderly and orphans were treated well. Emperor Wen abolished the cruel punishments of mutilation. He limited his own expenditures, sent women home from the palace so that they could marry, and eventually was able to eliminate taxes on land and produce, as well as customs barriers and passports. In 162 BC, he made peace with the Shan Yu, or King of the Shung Nu, who often challenged the border regions, declaring, We have bound ourselves together in the relationship of brotherhood in order to conserve the good people of the world. The next year, Emperor Wen proclaimed another general amnesty and freed all slaves held by the government. When Liu Pi, the king of Wu pleaded illness and refused to come to court because his son had been killed by the prince in a fight over a board game. Emperor Wen did not insist, sending him a stool and a cane as a sign he need not come. When Yuan Ong and other officials remonstrated with cutting words, he pardoned them and often put their advice into practice. Relationships throughout the empire improved, and the number of executions was greatly reduced. His successor, Emperor Qing declared Wen the great exemplar of the emperors and ordered that he should be worshipped along with Cao Tzu, the great founder of emperors. Emperor Jing ruled from 157 to 141 BC. Emperor Wen had heeded Chia Yi's advice to weaken the vassal kings by dividing Qi into seven kingdoms, but avoided taking territory from the feudal kingdoms. However, Chao Tso urged Emperor Jing to weaken the power of the vassal kings and began chipping away at their territories. Wu's recalcitrant King Liu Pi, meanwhile, had built up his power through state-owned copper and salt industries, such that he even eliminated taxes. When he learned that the emperor was going to move against him, he organized a coalition with Chu and five other kingdoms who resented their losses of territory to march on the capital and rid the world of Chao Tso. Liu An, king of Huainan, decided to join the rebellion also, but when he turned the soldiers over to the prime minister, he ignored the king and remained loyal to the Han government. Emperor Jing summoned Yuan Ong, who had been prime minister in Wu, and he, once he was alone with the emperor, 
suggested the whole rebellion could be easily defeated if he would execute Zhao Tso for wrongfully seizing territories from the feudal lords. Zhao Tso was beheaded in 154 BC, and Yuan Ong was sent to Wu as master of rights, where the king of Wu tried to enlist him as a general in the rebellion. Yuan Ong refused and would have been executed, but he was saved by a marshal he had previously pardoned for having a relationship with his maid. The Han commander, Zhou Yafu, craftily refused to battle the rebels until they were weakened by hunger. All the rebel kings were either killed or committed suicide. Everyone else was pardoned. After this, vassal kingdoms were usually divided among the heirs, so that the power of feudal lords faded away within two centuries. Wu Di's reign, 141 to 87 BC. Wu Di, meaning martial emperor, became emperor in 141 BC in his 16th year. And having been tutored by Confucian Wang Tsang, he requested that capable and good people with integrity who will speak frankly be recommended. However, those who follow the legalist philosophies of Shen Buhai, Shang Yang, and Han Feitsu were dismissed along with those guided by the diplomatic machinations of Su Qin and Zhang Yi. Wu Di appointed Dou Ying, Tian Fen, and Zhao Wan to the top three positions, all of whom were sympathetic to Confucian philosophy. Thus, Confucians became influential and tried to reform the capital by establishing a ceremonial building for court receptions and sending the marquises back to their territories but many marquises were married to royal princesses and did not want to leave the luxury of Chang'an. When the Confucians tried to bypass consulting with the Empress Dowager Do, Wu Di's grandmother, this Taoist became enraged and had several Confucians secretly investigated. Wan Song and Zhao Wan were compelled to commit suicide in jail, and Do Ying and Tian Fen were dismissed. When the Empress Dowager Dou died in 135 BC, Tian Fen became chancellor and promoted Confucians like scholar Gung Sun Hung, while downgrading all others. At the urging of Confucian Dung Chung Shu, an imperial university was established, and the five traditional classics of documents, odes, changes, rites, and the spring and autumn annals became the basis of examinations for officials. Fifty students were sent to be trained academically, but by 110 BC, Emperor Wu broke with the Confucians over the Feng, Feng and Shang sacrifices, and his later policies came to resemble the harsh punishments of legalism. After Chancellor Tian Fen died in 131 BC, Wu Di took greater control over his government. He ruled for more than half a century, and in the last 33 years, Wu Di had seven chancellors only one of whom died a natural death. The others were condemned for crimes. The emperor's master of writing became more powerful than the chancellor. Attempts by relatives and confidants, including eunuchs, to influence the emperor personally led to numerous court intrigues that weakened the former and the later Han dynasties. Irritated by barbarian raids, in 133 BC, Wu Di replaced diplomatic gift giving with a military campaign against the Xiong Nu in the northwest. But Chinese victory in Mongolia was not achieved until 119 BC, when a cavalry general returned with 40,000 enemy heads. General Li Guang, who had fought the Xiong Nu in 166 BC, led many of these campaigns, but never was made a marquis. He once asked the diviner, why not? The diviner asked him if he had ever done anything he regretted. And General Li Guang had to admit that he had once persuaded 800 men to surrender and then went back on his word and killed them. In 119 BC, he ended up disobeying orders, losing his way, and facing charges, cut his own throat. While Gung Sun Hung was recommending Confucian principles, Zhang Tong, the commandant of justice, was conducting conducting wider investigations and applying stricter punishments. When the rebellious plans of the kings of Huainan, Hengshan, and Changdu were discovered in 122 BC, more than 20,000 people were tried and executed. Liu An, the king of Huainan, was a grandson of Emperor Gaozu, 
And his father, after quarreling with a court and killing a man, had starved himself to death. When Liu An had presented the Taoist book, Hui Nanzi, to Emperor Wu in 139 BC, he had been led by Tian Fen to believe that he might succeed to the throne. For years, he made plans and preparations for a revolt, while his minister, Wei Bei, tried to persuade him it was inappropriate. Finally, when King Liu An was about to revolt, Wu Bei went to the authorities. An imperial prosecutor was sent, but before he arrived, Liu An cut his throat and died. Floods east of the mountains caused starvation, and 700,000 people were ordered to migrate to lands west of the pass. Taoist advisor Ji An was sent to observe what a fire had done in Honei, but on his way found such starvation and cannibalism in Honan that he ordered the imperial granaries open to relieve the distress, showing that Taoism was not a do-nothing philosophy when the natural way was to act. Knowing he had overstepped his authority, he returned for punishment. Wu Di was impressed by his wisdom and tried to promote him. Ji An declined a governorship, but occasionally would criticize the emperor sharply, especially for attacking the Xiong Nu. He berated Zhang Dong for excelling in evil and cruelty in tampering with the old laws. He argued for general principles in contrast to Zhang Tong's strict adherence to petty details. Ji An also criticized Gung Sun Hung and Confucians for flattering the emperor with hearts full of deceit and the facade of learning. Costs of the victory over the Xiong Nu in 119 BC were enormous, resulting in new taxes. Merchants who were becoming rich forced the poor to work for them as they bought up and hoarded goods for profit. As the wealthy declined to help the poor in their misery, Wu Di was moved to issue a new currency and punish numerous counterfeiters. When Emperor Wu traveled east in 114 BC, Two governors were so unprepared to provide for all the imperial attendants that they committed suicide. In the exposition to Nan Yu in 112 BC, criminals were pardoned to fight in the army, which became standard practice. Convict workers were also used in imperial construction projects. The forces set against the Yue kingdoms went as far south as Vietnam, and Dien was crushed by 109 BC. The next year, four commanderies were established in northern and central Korea. Envies, envoys were sent to western lands lured by the incentive of making money and trade. These profit makers became so lawless that they took to quarreling and attacking each other. But eventually, a series of defense stations was established. When Di Shan urged Wu Di to make peace with the Xiong Nu, he was challenged by Chang Tong as a stupid Confucian. Criticizing the severity of Zhang Tong's prosecutions of the kings Huinan and Qiangdu, the emperor was embarrassed as well and asked Di Shan if he were given a position in a province, could he keep the barbarians from plundering the region? Sensing that if he refused, he would face a criminal trial, Di Shan agreed to command one of the border posts where a few weeks later the Xiong Nu raided and cut off his head. After that, officials were too terrified to criticize the military policies. Suma Jin described how officials became increasingly harsh, especially after Wang Wenshu rose from a grave robber to become a corrupt official who offered rewards to help catch thieves, conscripted more men into the army, condemned thousands to provide slaves for the government monopolies of salt, iron, and liquor, and freed tens of thousands who were accused so that they could work on imperial building. He did little to prevent corruption, and his whole family was executed for his crimes after he committed suicide. From his example, lower officials went into lawbreaking, and the number of bandits increased until some had bands of several thousand men assumed the title, attacked cities, seized weapons, freed convicts, humiliated governors, killed officials, and demanded they be supplied with food. Smaller bands of several hundred plundered numerous villages and hamlets. Wu Di sent high officials to call out troops and attack the bandits, cutting off as many as 10,000 heads at a time. They arrested even more people for aiding the bandits with food. 
In a few years, most of the robber bands had been caught, but others went into hiding. Then a concealment law specifying the execution officials for not arresting reported bandits led officials to avoid investigations. Thus, the number of bandits increased again as officials sent in false reports to escape being involved. Du Zhou learned how to please Wu Di by trapping people he wanted removed into being arrested. When Du Zhou became Commandant of Justice, the number of officials in prison never fell below a hundred men. A hundred or more might be arrested on a case to be tried or to be witnesses. Prison officials would beat the accused until they confessed. Many fled into hiding to avoid arrest and later would be charged with more serious crimes even though an amnesty may have been issued. Eventually, 60,000 people had been arrested and officials had found grounds for charging another 100,000. Du Zhou rose from a poor secretary to one of the top three ministers with sons and grandsons in high offices and several hundred million in cash. In 99 BC, Du Zhou was transferred to military command of the capital and prosecuted thieves, high officials, and even brothers of Empress Wei. This was the year historian Su Ma Qian was arrested for pleading on behalf of condemned General Li Ling. The historian was arrested and convicted but refused to commit suicide because he wanted to finish writing his history. Not having sufficient funds to buy a commutation of a sentence, he suffered the humiliating punishment of castration, served as a eunuch palace writer, and continued the work that has given us so much knowledge of ancient China. He took the long view as indicated by the following proverb, proverb which he quoted, if you are going to be in a place for one year, then seed it with grain. If you're going to be there 10 years, plant trees. If you're going to be there 100 years, provide for the future by means of virtue. Su Ma Qian recounted how the harsh officials degenerated from those who decided right and wrong honestly to corrupted ones to the sycophants who followed laws and regulations involving harsh penalties just to stay out of trouble themselves. Some of the governors in the provinces were even more cruel. In discussing the money makers, he noted that the desire for wealth does not need to be taught because it is a part of human nature. He felt that those who spend all their knowledge and abilities accumulating money never have strength left over to consider giving some of it away. Because of all its expenses, the government monopolized the sale of alcohol and controlled the salt and iron works. Levies were extended to wagons and boats and taxes to stock animals. In battles with Xiong Nu between 103 and 90 BC, several times the Chinese commanders lost most of their men, numbering in the tens of thousands. In 91 BC, tens of thousands were arbitrarily executed for witchcraft and black magic. Su Ma Qian also passed on the life on the, and work of the Taoist poet Su Ma Xiang Ju, whose satires of royal ways were nonetheless appreciated by Wu Di. Sir Fantasy makes fun of the imperial hunt and is a phantasmagoria of rich language. In merriment, the Son of Heaven becomes lost in contemplation and decides to implement the traditional reforms of cultivating land, stocking lakes with fish for the people, caring for those in need, lessening punishments, and opening the classics. Everyone shares in the joys of this new hunt, and they are transformed to goodness. The poem concludes with criticism of those lords whose domains are almost all taken up with the hunting parks so that the people have no space to grow food. Emperor Wu accepted the poem, but objected to and removed the extravagant language describing the hunting parks. Shang Ju served Wu Di by justifying the Chinese civilizing of barbarian lands with its virtuous ways while condemning those who abused their foreign missions by robbing and killing. He suggested that the Western expeditions proved that Wu Di had the mandate of heaven, and he hoped that all could enjoy good fortune. He further glorified Wu Di in his poem on the Mighty One, and in a poem he left after his death in which he encouraged the emperor to carry out the auspicious Feng sacrifice at Mount Tai. After Wu Di. Before he died in 87 BC, Emperor Wu appointed his youngest son as his successor 
and since Emperor Zhao was only in his eighth year, Ho Guang to run the government. Ho Guang managed to put down an attempted takeover by Wu Di's oldest living son, Liu Dan, who committed suicide. Wu Guang came from the common people and implemented reforms to revitalize the exhausted empire. Loans were made to the poor. Payments and taxes were remitted in bad years or could be made in kind when grain prices were low. Horses were no longer demanded. Government was reduced and imperial lands were distributed to the people. A public debate on the state monopolies was held in 81 BC, an account of which was published in the next reign by Huan Quan as the dialogue, Discourses on Salt and Iron. Imperial monopolies of the salt and iron industries had been instituted in 119 BC when du Wu Di needed to raise money because of the Xiong Nu war expenses. Four years later, officials were appointed to equalize distribution by purchasing cheap commodities and selling when prices were high, thus preventing prices from being too low or too high and maximizing profit for the government. Four years after that, in 110 BC, a Bureau of Equalization and Standardization was established by Song Hung Yang. Although treasury deficits were eliminated and adequate stores supplied the arms, armies on the frontiers, the people forced to eat without salt because of its cost or use inferior iron tools to farm became discontent. Thus, 60 scholars were summoned from around the empire to debate the issues. In the dialogue, proponents, proponents of the government's current policies argued that they successfully provided iron tools to the peasants and increased trade and wealth. Criticizing this profiteering, Confucian, this profiteering Confucian reformers emphasizing agriculture wanted the use of money reduced with taxes collected in kind, grain or cloth. They found government harsh and oppressive, complaining of the disparities between the rich and poor. Critics also felt that expansion and foreign adventures had weakened China without maintaining safety. They argued the ancients had honored virtue and discredited the use of arms. Now these virtuous principles are discarded and reliance put on military force. Troops are raised to attack the enemy and garrisons are stationed to make ready for him. It is the long drawn out service of our troops in the field and the ceaseless transportation for the needs of the commissariat that cause our soldiers on the marshes to suffer from hunger and cold abroad, while the common people are burdened with labor at home. The establishment of a salt and iron monopoly and the institution of finance officials to supply the army needs were not permanent schemes. It is therefore, therefore desirable that they now be abolished. Government realists disagreed and relying on laws and punishments pointed to the success of Xiong Yang. But critics countered that it was short-lived and that Qin policies were unscrupulous. The reformers emphasized moral principles and complained that government officials were using their positions to increase their incomes to incalculable levels, a practice Confucius disapproved. Song Hung Yang's family fortune was estimated at tens of thousands of gold. Those in power criticized the scholars for talking but not acting and asked them if they could devise a means to bring peace to the country and subdue foreign lands so that they would not raid and attack the frontiers. Both sides complained that people now had little honesty and that morals were decaying. The wealth of some led common people to try to imitate their luxurious ways. The debate revealed the clear divisions between the realistic legalists in power and the principled scholars who wanted reforms. The monopolies on salt and iron were retained by the government, but the one on alcohol was ended and replaced with taxation. Relations with the Xiong Nu had improved, but when Fan Ming Yu was sent out to aid the Wu, the Wu Huan against them and found that the Xiong Nu had withdrawn, he decided his orders must be carried out by attacking the Wu Huan. He took 6,200 heads and was made a marquee. Thereafter, the Wu Huan raided China's northeast border. On the northwest border, Ho Guang sent an envoy to assassinate the Lo Lan king. When Emperor Zhao died in 74 BC, one possible heir, Liu Ho, 
raced to the capital and was made emperor. But forgetting about mourning while enjoying insatiable pleasures, he was removed from office after 27 days. Ho Kuang and the ministers arranged for Xuan to become emperor in his 18th year, arguing that he had been taught the odes, analects, and filial piety, and that he was kind, benevolent, and loving to others. Ho Kuang offered to resign, but he was retained and ran the government until his death in 68 BC. In the next two years, the dangerous Ho clan was methodically and completely removed from power, and Emperor Xuan began to rule for himself. Brought up as commoner and having observed the people's sufferings, Emperor Xuan rewarded kind officials and demoted the harsh ones. Instead of punishing corrupt officials, he allowed them to resign. His consent was required for capital punishment, and he implemented numerous other legal reforms, such as appointing special judges for difficult cases, pardoning those hiding relatives, investigating deaths in prison, exempting the elderly from punishment in most cases, and searching for and reporting unjust trials. An official who had used capital punishment so much that he was called Uncle Butcher was publicly executed for his cruel tyranny. Emperor Xuan gave grants to the heirs of capable officials who died poor, exempting those in mourning from required services, abolished laws banning gatherings of people even at weddings, and increased salaries of lower officials to prevent extortion. During drought, he reduced his own table and official salaries temporarily while remitting taxes. Military garrisons were reduced, government land was loaned to the poor, royal preserves were open to cultivation, and the price of salt was lowered. Heaven shone on these beneficent policies with abundant harvests. The Xiong Nu struggled with civil wars, and one of their leaders, vying for support, visited the Chinese court, and instead of resenting his imperial title, Emperor Xuan honored him as a guest and sent him back with such rich presents that the other Xiong Nu rival moved to the west. For several years, the Confucian classics were studied and clarified, with the emperor having the final word in 51 BC. Near the end of his reign, Emperor Xuan issued an edict declaring that not prohibiting evil is not clemency, nor is dismissing criminals the absence of tyranny. While those who consider tyranny and wrong capability have missed the mean as well. Noting that military service and forced labor have been reduced, he found that there was still poverty and corrupt officials because they took the extra money given them to use in place of soldiers. This emperor seems to have done his best to harmonize the virtues of legalistic discipline and Confucian benevolence. Even when he was still only heir apparent, Yuan criticized his father for applying laws too severely and suggested that he employ more Confucian masters. In 48 BC, Emperor Xuan died, and 27-year-old Emperor Yuan selected Confucians to run his government. Modest reforms reduced expenditures and lightened punishments. The civil service examination was expanded to include a moral component as well as the literary test. Emperor Yuan's adoption of Confucian rituals and principles led also to the favoring of relatives in the name of filial piety. Unfortunately, the resulting nepotism and matriarchal influences contributed to the eventual fall of the former Han dynasty in the next two generations. Under Yuan, anyone who passed the examinations could become a student of a Confucian scholar, but soon the number was limited to 1,000 persons. Confucian influence was checked somewhat by the eunuch Xia Xian, the chief palace writer, who had many Confucians arrested and executed because they criticized him. Rather than go to jail, the most prominent Confucian committed suicide. Xi Xian outlived Emperor Yuan, but was exiled by Emperor Cheng after he came into power in 33 BC. The office of palace writer was abolished so that eunuchs would not have such power. Like his father, Emperor Cheng put his maternal relatives into prominent positions. While he enjoyed drinking, banqueting, and music, the Wang clan, clan controlled the government. The former Han Dynasty was in decline and would be replaced in the next generation.
So any um, questions or comments, discuss, discussion? Okay. Full jails, uh, to me, it's not a, a uh, sign of a very healthy society. You know, like today in the United States, we have more people incarcerated than anybody else, you know? And the, and, with, and the public opinion or what you might believe from the politicians, you know, we need to put more people in jail for longer periods of time, you know? And yet, uh, it's very wasteful. It's wasteful of money because it costs a lot of money to keep people in jail. And it's wasteful for the people in jail's lives being, you know, not being able to be productive. But I think it's quite stark, though, the, the legalistic and what happened with the Qin Dynasty, you know, because you had, um, you know, they really put it into practice to see if this really works. Let's have real strict laws, you know, and really control everything. And, you know, it lasted 15 years <laughs> before it totally fell apart. And even the people that had no weapons, they revolted anyway. You don't need weapons to revolt, you know. Uh, so... Um, it just doesn't work. I think. Well, yeah, either extreme of the left or the right. And when you have a kind of totalitarian state, whether it's communist or fascist, basically the state, well, that was Han Fei's philosophy, right? Is that the state should be powerful and not the people. It's the opposite of a democratic. Should, all the power should be in one person, not spread out among all the people, you know. And it, it may seem logical in a very limited way, but it sure does, doesn't work. <laughs> Unless, well, I mean, even if that person was a wise person, they wouldn't do it. They would let people do what they want. I mean, they wouldn't tell everybody. What, a wise person doesn't tell everybody what to do, you know? So, yeah, and getting people telling, and then executing or punishing the relatives of people. And that's so that, you know, that's supposed to be a deterrent, you know? It's like nuclear weapons and stuff. It's supposed to be like, well, you better not do anything bad because if you do something bad and get caught, we'll, we'll, we'll punish your whole family, you know? And, it's like, and so then the family says, don't anybody in this family do anything bad, you know? <laughs> it's supposed to be, and then everybody's cowering in fear, you know? And trying to rule people by fear, to me, is a negative way. It's so much better to, to, to induce people to be good because that's more natural and let people, you know, be loving and do what is good and not have to be, live in fear you know, of being punished. And, and to be taught, educated, that it's really better to be virtuous, which is what the Confucians were trying to do. And for a while, they, they got in there and had their policies, and it seemed to work. It seems to me, you know, that the punishments could be reduced, and the land could be given to the people, and the virtue could be encouraged, and, you know, wisdom in and, and the counselors, and, and not so much profit-seeking, sharing more of the wealth, and the equalization of justice, and so on that all those things, those Confucian principles, they really work. Which to me, you know, he was a wise philosopher because it works in practice. And the Taoists too, in a way, would, that would let people do what they want as long as they don't, yeah, do bad, right. So, okay, thanks.